Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Catherine Weber, and as the interim director of the Lewiston Public Library, I would like to welcome you all to the Great Falls Forum. Uh, the forum is a monthly speaker series featuring leaders in the areas of business, public policy, academia, and the arts, and is a partnership with Bates College, the Sun Journal, and the Lewiston Public Library. This year marks the 25th season of the Great, pa Great Falls Forum. Uh, we thank you for your support and ensuring the program's continued success. Today's program is also streaming live via Zoom and Facebook, and a recording will be available on the library's YouTube page after. Uh, please visit lplonline.org for more information. Please also mark your calendars for our next Great Falls Forum happening on May 18th for a talk entitled what can the nature of Maine teach us about the nature of life? Featuring author and photographer Margie Patlack. For more information, that will also be available soon. At the conclusion of today's program, there will be an opportunity for audience questions. Those in the room are welcome to raise their hands and those joining us virtually uh, can enter their questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom or commenting on Facebook and we'll read these aloud to our speaker. And now I have the pleasure of introducing today's featured speaker, Andrea Berry. Andrea joined Wild Seed Project as the organization's executive director in 2021, bringing extensive nonprofit leadership experience and a passion for decolonization and climate justice. For the six years prior to this role, Andrea worked as the director of community engagement at Maine Initiatives, a small community-based foundation working to advance racial justice and equity. A community organizer at heart, Andrea has spent her career working to build social movements around racial justice, gender equity, equal access to education, and climate justice. Andrea serves on the board of directors at Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative and Resources for Organizing and Social Change, and was also recently elected to serve on the select board for the town of North Yarmouth, Maine, where she is leading community-driven efforts around land conservation and environmental stewardship. At home, Andrea gardens to supply her roadside farm stand and bakes wood-fired pizza in her homemade outdoor clay oven. She lives in North Yarmouth, Maine with her partner, their middle school aged daughter, two dogs, and four chickens. Please join me in welcoming Andrea to Lewiston. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, I am so glad to be here today talking with all of you and, and everyone at home as well or at, at work or in the office. Um, we are gonna spend today talking about Wild Seed Project and our work to plant seeds of resilience within our community, throughout the state and, and really throughout the environment that we love and that we live, work and play in. So I'm going to start off today uh, when we're, we're talking about land, we're talking about plants and particularly talking about native plants. It, it feels very important for me to start off with a land acknowledgement. So I'm going to read this off for you. As we get, begin this program that will engage us in planting seeds of place, we want to recognize that the land we're leading this program from and that here at Wild Seed Project we are tied to in so many ways is the ancestral Wabanaki territory, we now call Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the people of the Dawn. The Abenaki, Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, McBon Nation, Penobscot Nation, and Passamaquoddy Tribe, and honor their relationships to the plants, animals, and other beings that have been thre threatened and displaced through settler colonialism. We encourage you all who are here with us today and at home to learn more about the historical and present day relationships of indigenous peoples to the place where you live. The purpose of this acknowledgement is to allow this knowledge to shape our work. Our work is dependent on understanding and reckoning with the history and present day violence of colonization. The exploitative practices of colonialism are directly responsible for the displacement of these important native plants that form the foundations of our local food webs. From this understanding, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to build and rebuild reciprocal relationships with people, plant, fungi, soil, water, air? Reestablishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is an important action in deconstructing our colonial legacy. 
We've gathered here to learn more about reestablishing native plant life and let the knowledge of the roots and the breadth of the legacy of displacement guide us as we do that today. And finally, we also wanna recognize that while we're leading this program and sharing these resources, these skills and information did not start with Wild Seed Project, nor me, nor will they end with us or any of us. We are sharing the collection of teachings from so many teachers, both human and non-human. At Wild Seed Project, we know that the best way to learn how to sow seeds is to watch plants sow their own seeds and try to replicate that process as best we can. And so as we get started, we send gratitude to all of our teachers as we start this conversation. Thank you. So who am I? I know uh, those of you watching online can't see my face. So here it is, um, big, bright and smiling at you today. So my name is Andrea Berry uh, and I'm the executive director of Wild Seed Project. Uh, you just heard way too much about me and my background to start off. Um, so I'm not gonna go much deeper into that. But what I am gonna talk about is how I got here to you today and to Wild Seed Project. So this is a picture of me and my now 14 year old daughter, Cora. Um, and when Cora was little and also as she's gotten older, uh, if you ask her what's the biggest thing that she's scared about, she says climate change. The generation who is growing up now, who is going to inherit our planet and our environment from all of us, all of us in this room um, and all of us at home, they know that this is a huge threat. And so as my daughter, when she was growing up, would have nightmares that would wake her up uh, for fear of a changing climate and the, the way that our planet will be in the future, I thought a lot about what can I do as her mom, as a member of our community, as a member of our society, what are the places where I can get involved? And I started with plants. I have always been a gardener. This is a, a snapshot of my uh, garden back there. Um, and one of the things that I can promise you is that Cora never before 2021, uh, when I joined Wild Seed Project, had ever helped me in the garden. Um, <laughs> not her favorite thing for sure. Uh, but as I joined this organization and started to think about how can I have some kind of impact on our changing climate, plants became the answer for me. And in talking about how plants are the answer for me, they became the answer for her. So I'm going to talk to you about why native plants are going to help us build a resilient landscape and a resilient ecosystem in the face of our changing climate. And hopefully give you some agency and some feeling that there are things that you can do to respond to what is coming and to help make the planet a better place now and a stronger place as we move forward. So Wild Seed Project is about 10 years old as an organization. In fact, next year is our 10 year anniversary. Um, and so I feel very honored to be here speaking to you today, knowing that the Great Falls Forum is 25 years old. Um, amazing to be part of this conversation and, and part of the way that the Lewiston community is responding uh, and addressing these important issues. So at Wild Seed Project, our mission is specifically focused on returning native plants to the main landscape, to all different parts of the main landscape. So how do we do that? Uh, we really split that into three different sections or three different buckets. The first place and the place where we started uh, with our founder, Heather McCargo, who's an amazing horticulturalist, who felt very strongly that uh, it didn't have to just be the realm of botanists and uh, the horticulturists who are working at um, professional gardens uh, to manage and protect and to grow native plants. So instead, she really believed in empowering and creating accessible access to native plants, which starts with native seeds. Um, and so we at Wild Seed Project really focus on seed stewardship. We uh, hand collect ethically and sustainably seeds from over 100 different species of native plants to Maine. 
and those seeds are made available both through sale on our website, but also through substantial donation programs. We hand out seeds to teachers all across the state for them to do work with their students. Uh, we work very closely with a number of indigenous led organizations in distributing both seeds and plants to Wabanaki folks. We're very involved in the ash protection collaboration across Wabanaki, uh, run out of the University of Maine, working to collect and to grow ash seeds uh, in order to protect ash trees from the ash, emerald ash borer and to help to create uh, hopefully some uh, genetically resilient different ash species, or not species, ash uh, strains that will help to withstand this uh, invasive beetle. Um, but one of the core pieces to all of that is that it doesn't have to be with us. I don't have a degree in botany. I come from the education world and from the philanthropic world, but but what I do have an education is in is in trying my hand at putting things in the ground and watching things grow and watching things fail. Um, and what I really believe is that trial and error and getting your hands dirty and trying this is the best way to learn how to garden and to grow any kind of plant and specifically native plants. And so we work with volunteers, with community members all over to build up your skill sets on how to grow native plants from seed uh, and how to take care of them and how to be activists uh, to make sure that more native plants go out uh, into the world. We do a lot of our work through our nature-based education. Um, so as I mentioned, we work with schools, uh, we do things like this, um, and we do um, uh, lots in the fall of hands-on seed sowing workshops to get people the physical skills to make sure that you understand, all right, I have this pack of seeds, how am I gonna get them all the way to a beautiful meadow and walk you through that process. Um, and then the, the last piece of what we do is really recognizing that um, native plants don't have to just be in a massive meadow or in an untended forest, um, that we can actually put native plants into our manicured gardens, into our landscaping, uh, into the places where we are actually engaging and building landscapes ourselves. Uh, and so we work with different organizations, with corporations, with towns uh, to install native plant gardens, demonstrate gardens and demonstration landscapes, because we know if you can see a garden, I mean, certainly it's true for me, if I walk past a plant in a garden and I, I see it, I want to take out my phone, I want to figure out what uh, that plant is, and then I want to go back home and figure out how I can put it into my space where I live. Um, and so we really believe in doing this. And this is actually um, a snapshot from the Mafka store in Freeport on Main Street, and that is L.L. Bean in the background with all of those canoes. Um, and so we're really trying trying to put in small demonstration native plant gardens in places where people can, uh, can see it in everyday life. You know, there's opportunities. There are native street trees all the way up and down Lisbon Street in a lot of different ways. There are planters that will go out uh, as we get a little bit warmer. Putting native plants in places where people can see them, can identify with them, that normalizes them in both the natural landscape and the built landscape is a huge opportunity to, to build people like me, you know, who are concerned about climate change, who are concerned about a whole host of things, but don't know where to start. Well, we can all start in the places where we're putting our hands in the dirt and putting plants in the ground. So before we jump too far into the theory and the concept, I want to start off with this idea of what in the world are native plants. So when we define native plants, um, we really focus on plants that were grown here prior to European colonization and that have co-evolved over millennia with the region's animals, insects, amphibians, bacteria, and fungus. That second half of that sentence is critical for us to understand why native plants have an impact on building resilient landscapes because they are here and co-evolved with all of the different parts of the environment. And because of that, it means that they are a critical part of that environment. If we take plants that are from some other faraway place that weren't evolved here and we put them in the ground, uh, they may do really well. They may do really, really well, like we see with a number of invasive plants that are coming um, and taking over landscapes. Um, but what they aren't doing is working in relationship with the animals, with the fungus, with the bacteria, with the insects, with the amphibians that are here. 
So when we talk about native plants, I really cannot emphasize enough that whatever it is that you care about, native plants are the key. So who here cares about birds? Yes, birds rely on native plants because native plants are the ones that host insects, which they feed to their babies. They often provide food for birds, uh, all different kinds of things. So native plants are really critical. If you love birding, put in native plants in your garden, put in native plants outside where you are, you will see many more birds. What about bugs? Anybody like bugs? Harder sell, harder sell. <laughs> bugs the same way. Insect species have evolved to be most often specialists, whether that's on a genus or a species or a larger family of, uh, of plants. We see native plants as key for not just the, the pollen moment. Uh, so when you, know, you have the monarch butterfly is a great example. Monarch butterflies are uh, relying on the pollen and the nectar that they're, create, they're collecting from milkweed plants, but that's not the only part of their life that relies on the milkweed. They lay their eggs on the milkweed plants. Their eggs hatch and uh, the caterpillars come out and they eat specifically those milkweeds. Now those caterpillars may go and form a chrysalis in a whole variety of different places, whether that's under the, you know, the bumper of a car or on the underside of a rake or under some other tree. But when those butterflies hatch and come out, or when those butterflies come out of that chrysalis stage, they go right back to those milkweed as a critical part of their life cycle. And so native plants are gonna help us to build up all the different elements of the life cycle, not just the part where we're providing nectar and pollen, but all the different places for creatures to live. This is a hard one. Who eats food? Yes. Um, so native plants are critical for our ability to grow food. They support um, and bring in native pollinators. A huge percentage of what is pollinating the vegetables in all of our vegetable gardens and on farms, uh, they are not necessarily, you know, we can truck in bees from South America, we can truck in bees from, from Europe, from all different places and bring them around to help provide that pollinization. However, if we don't have that, if we're seeing honeybees suffering from a variety of different uh, colony collapse issues, um, if those honeybees disappear, we definitely need to rely on native bees and other native pollinators to make sure that we have food to grow. And so a lot of what we do at Wild Seed Project is talk about what are the native plant pairings that can go with vegetables and fruit producing plants to help to increase the overall pollinators. And it's our theory that that also will help to increase the, the plant yield um, showing up. And then who cares about soil and water health? Yes. Um, so when we put in native plants, they are key to helping hold the banks of rivers. They are key to helping to keep our water clean by fishing out um, the pollutants that are going into our water systems, rushing off the street sides, um, all different kinds of uh, situations where water is pooling, we can plant native plants and create rain gardens that help to minimize that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that piece moving forward. Um, and the last one, who's worried about climate change? So we're gonna talk about how native plants, and I wanna be really clear, native plants are not going to stop our changing climate. But what they can do is to help us take action to make sure that the effects of our changing climate can be mitigated, um, where insects and birds and other creatures that are coming up from the south as the temperature warms have a place to go and food and shelter with native plants that we have up here, uh, where we can help to, again, create um, less runoff and prevent erosion and help to manage large weather events all different types of things that we're experiencing with the increasingly changing climate, native plants can help to fill that gap. Your big challenge today isn't actually to get excited about native plants, because I promise you, you're gonna, you're gonna wrap up today and you're gonna be all ready for native plants in your garden, but the biggest piece is actually for us to change our definition of beauty. Close your eyes for a second and think about a beautiful garden. 
Think about what that beautiful garden looks like. Does it have big blooms? Does it have big colors? Are the leaves eaten or are they fully intact? Are there spider webs? Are there leaves on the ground, dead leaves? What does that garden look like to you? So if you're thinking, if you're like me before I, and you can open your eyes. Um, <laughs> if you're like me, before I came to Wild Seed Project, my definition of a beautiful garden included things that I had already put into the landscape at my home. A giant, now giant Japanese maple that is cascading with bright red leaves. Um, bearded irises that my grandfather handed down to me uh, that I came and I brought from New York and I planted up uh, in my garden in Maine. Um, lilac bushes and um, pristine leaves and petals. Uh, no nests that are folding over different leaves, none of those things. That is the kind of stuff that I pictured before I came to Wild Seed Project. And you know what the, the core commonality to that was in that garden? It was all about me. It was what I wanted to see in a garden. But what it wasn't was engaging in any kind of way with the animals, with the insects, uh, with any other part of the environment. I had centered myself in my garden. And I wanna challenge you to think differently about what beautiful can be. The, the pandemic has actually helped us a little bit with this. Um, Pre-pandemic, the I know for me, I would walk past a garden on my way to a meeting or on my way to a restaurant and I would see it and that was it. During the pandemic, for sure, when I was at home, I started not just looking at the flowers that I was planting in my garden, but experiencing the life that was happening in there. The insects buzzing around, the garter snake that is living inside and slithering within all of the different plants that I'm putting in the ground. Uh, the, you know, love them or hate them, the little voles that are uh, living in the garden and sometimes chewing up the bulbs um, that I've put down in the plants. But the life that I got to see when I slow down and take a look at that garden, that's become beautiful. We've taken a pause and we want to see vibrant life. And we start to recognize that if we decenter ourselves and we start to think about a garden that is buzzing and that's beautiful, that's supporting all different types of insects and other creatures, that's providing uh, in, uh, caterpillars and other bugs that birds who are living in the nearby trees are coming to grab and bring back for their young, all of those different things. If we can change what that definition of beauty is for ourselves, we can actually decenter our priorities and recognize that a beautiful garden is something that is vibrant, and active and dynamic. That when we bring life, not just plant life, but when we bring all kinds of life into our garden, there really is some amazing beauty there. Now we're gonna see if this video works. Um, do you need so when we're thinking about um, our gardens, this is actually a short video that I took of the garden that just runs right along the side of my driveway. We'll try it. Oh, that's okay. So we're, we're not hearing the sound, but you can imagine the buzzing of bumblebees and the sound of crickets. Um, and you can see all of the different plants. This is on a not windy day. Those are all different bees and other types of uh, wasps and creatures that are moving back and forth in between all of those plants. Now those big, beautiful uh, frondy plants with the yellows, uh, yellow flowers, that's called partridge pea. Um, and they are beautiful, one of our very few native annual plants um, where they're very vigorous seeders. Um, and I'll show you a, a drawing of their seed pods um, in a minute or two, um, but they spread their seeds far and wide. And when there's open patches of bare ground, they're some of the first things that will grow up in that 
that space. And as with other peas, uh, these native peas are nitrogen fixers and they're helping to build up soil health. Um, and they die all the way down. Um, and so all of the different parts of the nutrients that are in the, the bodies of those plants go back down into the soil and help to build up healthy, strong soil. And that garden is beautiful because it's alive and it's moving and it's jumping around. Whoop, I'm gonna, there we go. Now I wanna make the case that native plants are garden plants. So when we talk about, often when I go and talk to folks about native plants, um, the, the story is, oh, there's this beautiful meadow outside of my home or on my drive into work, or, oh, I just love walking through the forest. Now, you are exactly right. Those are native plants. Those are spaces that are full of all of the benefits of those different species. However, I also want to make the case that when we think about our built landscape, about the places where we are controlling what goes in the ground and how it's used and how it functions, that we can bring native plants into those spaces as well. We know uh, one of the biggest harms of colonization uh, is the destruction of these natural wild spaces. Um, humans for millennia have been managing plants. So I wanna be really clear about that, that uh, when we're talking about native plants, these are not plants that have evolved without any type of hum human interaction. Wabanaki folks have been moving and collecting and tending to native plants for time immemorial. And as colonizers came into this land, we shifted the care from a care of plants to thinking about plants as commodities. We cut down forests for our own use. Uh, we eliminated field or eliminated woods so that we could plant farms. Um, we cut down trees all around um, homes and homesteads, and sometimes we would put in uh, non-native fruit-bearing trees uh, that we preferred more, maybe that came from Europe, brought over here. Um, we have manipulated and managed our landscapes, uh, so much so that natural spaces and spaces that uh, are pristine spaces that existed prior to colonization are few and far between. So yes, we absolutely need to protect those meadows, those woods, those river and streamside environments. But if we really want to make an impact on our changing climate or on building climate resilience, we need to be thinking about these other places too, the places where humans have already disrupted the land. And it's our responsibility to shift and to change and to start to build that space back, to return biodiversity, to build up ecosystem health, and to create healthy habitats for all of the creatures and not just us. So I really do promise you, native plants are garden plants. They have big, beautiful, bold colors. Um, so these pictures on the, the far side, that's just on the edge of the driveway, that's, that's part of my driveway. You already saw that before with the big yellow plants. Um, this is just a little bit farther into the house and those um, purples that are a little hard to see here, but I, um, I, I suspect those of you online probably can't see them at all. There are these beautiful little purple flowers um, called blue-eyed grass, which I actually saw growing in my lawn uh, and help to move them and save them from our lawnmower and put them right into my gardens. Behind them is um, early goldenrod um, that you can start to see popping up there. Now, goldenrods are some of the most valuable plants that you can put into your gardens and into landscapes, goldenrods and asters. Um, they are providing late season flowers um, and late season food for a whole host of creatures. If you think about what is uh, the September and October landscape look like, it's a full riot of bright yellow of goldenrod. They're some of the only flowers that are still out at that time. Um, and if we want creatures to make it not just through the summer, but all the way through the year, we need to make sure that we're providing fodder and food um, for them at all times. So I I embrace goldenrod and I put it all throughout my garden. It's a really beautiful, bold addition. Um, 
these other two images are um, one of them is at a home um, that tree in the middle is a pagoda dogwood and it is one of our native dogwood trees it's really beautiful and it loves shade um, thinking about you know often we're thinking about our gardens and they're out in the sunniest spots um, I know the edge of my driveway is one of them um, but we can also do some gardening in the shade and so many of Maine's native plants really are shade loving or at least shade tolerant so for those of you who are um, like me and have always struggled with coming up with a um, manicured shade garden, native plants can help to fill in those spaces really beautifully. And I don't want to leave out the opportunity for planters. So these are actually plants right outside of the Wild Seed Project office in North Yarmouth. Um, and they were planted early in uh, the season last year and haven't yet gone to flower yet. Um, but I promise you that all different types of native plants create uh, really beautiful planters um, and beautiful street plants for us to experience in all different ways. And so I know as Lewiston puts out planters um, right up and down Lisbon Street as you go into the year. Think about can native plants be incorporated there? Is there a way that we can then turn that into a pollinator pathway uh, where instead of um, plants that our native bees and butterflies and caterpillars don't care very much about, so they're not going to be down here in this space, if we put native plants in places, creatures will come. They will find it, they'll tell their friends, and it will be a whole different kind of experience. And so not only will there be the vibrant experience of people down here in Lisbon Street, putting native plants into this space will bring in creatures as well. And I do want to challenge you because I believe that lawns are a thing of the past. Uh, lawns uh, are okay in moderation. Um, we actually just had an article in Down East Magazine where the title was a very evocative, uh, this woman wants to kill your lawn. Um, and in fact, I come a little bit more flexibly to that concept where I want to challenge you to think about your lawns uh, and focus on what you need and not uh, just a big, wide expanse of lawns. When we think about lawns, uh, I need to think about where they come from. And in fact, the concept of a lawn was a status symbol. So if you think about having large estates where the folks who were living and uh, owning those estates, they were showing that they were so wealthy that they could have massive, unproductive spaces in a lawn. And so we take that back to our suburbs. Uh, here in the United States in really strong ways. Um, we've kind of had it ingrained in us um, that a beautiful suburban space includes a massive lawn with a white pick in front, in front of it. Um, and I wanna challenge you to think about not completely destroying or getting rid of your lawn, but to only keep the lawn that you need and that you use. So if we go back to my daughter, Cora, um, she is an avid soccer player. So uh, I can't get rid of all of my lawn because then I'll have soccer in the house and I need soccer outside instead. Um, so we do have a large space in the back of our house. We've got two dogs. We've got a bunch of chickens. I've got a soccer playing daughter. We have a lawn, but what we don't have is all lawn. We've taken the spaces when we look at our house, what are the places where we weren't using that lawn and what can we put there instead? We've put in native fruit trees like beach plums. We've put in and let the blackberries kind of go wild along the edges of our yard so that they're starting to slowly hem in and the green grass space is shrinking and the edible blackberries are growing. Uh, I am building an American hazelnut hedge uh, in between the space where we're not using and the fenced in area for my dogs so that we can have, again, edible, productive, nature-filled spaces where we weren't using any of that area before. That is the challenge. So in fact, this picture here with these beautiful um, white to blue flowers, those are bluets or Quaker ladies. Um, and I know many of us in Maine have those growing up in our lawns to begin with. Um, there's even, there's some little purple violets uh, tucked in there. That's a picture of my lawn that does get soccer played on it, that has folks running around and enjoying. 
So not only are we reducing our lawn, um, we're trying to move away from the European grasses, those monoculture grasses that we're all used to, um, they don't add anything. And in order to maintain them, we need to often spray pesticides and apply non-organic fertilizers, which can create real, real deep harm, not only uh, for the creatures that we're trying to live in there. Um, if you've got any dandelions popping up and you've done a lot of uh, chemical fertilizer, uh, the creatures that are coming to those dandelions for nectar are going to ingest some of that that chemical. Um, if we are spraying our lawns, it's not good for us. It's not good for our the animals that we're caring for. And it's not good for the animals and the creatures writ large. Um, so allowing things like bluets and Quaker ladies and violets or um, wild strawberries also make a really wonderful ground cover um, and a tasty fruit. Um, all of those different kinds of things will allow us opportunity to say, all right, so I'm going to only have the lawn that I want and that I need. And uh, I'm going to start to work to move away from uh, the monoculture lawn, which we know we've been trained to say that that is what beauty is. Um, but I want to challenge you to push people because I promise you, if you either let some of that lawn grow during the month of May, um, or if you let that lawn grow like me, all the time, um, <laughs> that it will be okay. And some of the things that you can do if you're worried about your neighbors saying something critical, put up a sign that says, hey, this is a native plant pollinator space. We are encouraging this, we're doing this on purpose. I have put up a very small little edge around some of the yard um, with a kind of, different stakes of wood that I have found um, just hanging around in the woods, little tiny sticks. Um, and it does help to tell people, oh wait, no, she did this on purpose. This, this wasn't because we're neglectful or we're not caring for our space or we're just too busy, um, but actually this is a place that it's intentionally there and it really does change how people see it and how people engage in it. Now I want to challenge you. This is my um, aspirational lawn here on the right, um, or I guess on on your left. Um, this is a house up in the the Rockland area where, um, if I was standing in between those spaces of plants, they would be eight feet tall. So it would be well, well over my head. This is a wetter space, and those are things like New York ironweed and coastal Joe pie weed, um, and a whole bunch of other really beautiful marshy plants. Um, and this family decided, you know what? Our kids are off at college. We are not using our lawn anymore. But what we do want is some big beautiful garden that when people come over they're filled with awe and so over the course of about 20 years they've cultivated and built up this amazing space uh, that really feels magical you walk through what is a regular old patio in through a gate and into that um, there is so much that we can do so much creativity that can happen when we think about native plants and incorporating native plants into our landscaping now I need some lawn. I promise you that our banks, our companies, the businesses that are either creating massive lawn spaces just for curb appeal or are creating islands of mulch with maybe a single, you know, plant over here and a plant all the way over there and a plant all the way over there. Those are spaces where we can actually make substantial change and add in so much more life and make a real impact. I mean, you can look at that lawn and go, oh, well, that's so beautiful. We don't wanna mess that up. It's so pristine. But yeah, I heard the oh's around the audience that there's so much that we can do if we can change how we're thinking about spaces and really change our own definition of beauty and clean. So I just want to pause here and um, share a quick uh, word about pesticides and non-organic fertilizers. Um, and this is just a, a pleading request to please not use them. Um, <laughs> it is uh, really dangerous for all of the critters that are using our spaces, including us, our kids, our pets. You know, my dog runs out in the yard. Any of those kind of things, they do get soaked up, not only soaked up into the 
creatures that are uh, getting the nectar or playing in those spaces where we're using these chemicals, but also they make their way into our water. Um, and we, we know that across the, the state of Maine, there are sites where PFAS has become really challenging, um, where water is starting to become undrinkable. The more that we apply pesticides and non-organic fertilizers to, especially to our lawns, the worse that our water quality is going to be. If you can shift to native plants, if you can think about changing and not having that massive lawn, you're not only going to be able to change your own regimen, right? Nobody's going to complain that they don't have to mow their lawn every single weekend. Um, but you're also changing the way that you are supporting the environment instead of hurting the environment by managing. Get off my soapbox now. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll jump right back on because what we really need to think about is how are we going to change how we interact with the built landscape. And so again, you know, we think about native plants, we think about those wide meadows, we think about swamps and bogs and forests, and we need those. We need those to not get dug up and paved over for sure. But if we're gonna make any change here, we also need to change the way that we're managing the spaces where we've already done as people that damage. Um, and it is our opportunity to make a small update and change. Our climate is absolutely changing. Uh, here I've got two different diagrams for you. Um, the first one with the state of New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire is not moving. I promise you. But what is moving uh, is the the way that the state of New Hampshire feels. So um, this diagram is saying um, between now and about 2040, the environment in the state of New Hampshire is going to feel more like the environment in Maryland uh, and West Virginia and Pennsylvania than it is the state of New Hampshire now. That is stark. That is changing so much faster than anything we've experienced before. You can see how it's reflected in the state of Maine as well, um, where we're seeing the hardiness zones. So if any of you are gardeners, the hardiness zones uh, are shifting, especially the northern zones. Uh, they're, they're getting warmer. Everything is changing. Now, again, native plants aren't going to solve this problem, but what they can do is to help to create some resilience for what is coming. If we look here, um, our predictions for uh, what the forest cover will look like across the eastern United States between 2070 and 2100, um, that we're going from spruce fir forests in northern Maine and the maple beech birch forest that we know of down here, and we are shifting to oak pine and oak hickory forests. The Maine that we know is going away. Uh, it is changing, it is shifting. It's really scary. It's scary We think about my daughter again. I think about me, I'm terrified of this. So the only way that I can move from kind of immobilized fear into action is to find something that I can do. And the thing that I can do and the thing that we can all do is to help to respond uh, by planting native plants. Native plants are gonna help us in all of these different kinds of ways. They're gonna support the pollinators who are moving north because of the changing weather. They are going to help us to clean the air as all plants do. They're gonna help us to sequester carbon. Native plants and the biomass created by native plants are gonna to help to, in those deep, deep roots, take the carbon and, and put it right down into the soil, but not seep into the soil, hold it as the native plants are. We're gonna to help to grow food, to absorb water from the massive changes in the environment from these big weather events that we're having. They're gonna help with erosion control and certainly providing habitat as well as helping to combat the invasives that we as humans have brought over here already. And now it really is imperative that we help to eradicate those plants that are destroying our ecosystems. So we need native plants um, but we need them grown from seed. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit why. Uh, but first, I just wanna show you the beauty and diversity of seeds. These are just 12 different species of native plants to Maine um, and the different seed heads and seed pods um, that they provide. Now I wanna challenge you. 
take a look at this and see if you can guess at least one. Pick out something that you think you know, one of these seeds, and I'm going to show you which they all are in a second. Anybody get one? Yeah. So um, you remember I showed you that little video of the um, bumblebees all over the partridge pea? So over there, um, right next to where it says grown from seed, that seed pod, that twisting seed pod that looks like a pea pod um, is the partridge pea seed pod. And I'll also add for anybody who's talking to me later, I have partridge pea in my earrings and I'm happy to show you those little seeds. Um, but the, the beauty for me, and this is one of the most powerful things is that we are, uh, we don't see seeds all that often anymore. If we create landscapes from plants bought from nurseries, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, we're actually buying plants that have been modified so much um, that they are no longer sexually functional. And so they are no longer producing seeds or certainly they're no longer producing viable seeds. So part for me of the beauty of native plants is that we get to see again, their full life cycle. They are spreading and interacting and growing uh, and seeds are a critical part of that. We need seeds because at nurseries, they are mostly providing plants that are either cuttings or clones. So there's a reason why each one of those has a uniform color, right? Uniform blue, uniform red, uniform pink. Um, all of those things, those are clones they're identical plants. So if we have identical plants, we don't have the genetic diversity that can react to all of our changing environments. So if we have high wind events, or certainly we all experienced a really short winter this year. With our short winter, we need plants that can survive through that. And if we had all one identical plant, throughout the winter, and that plant really needed a super long cold winter and it died, poof, there's the entire species, gone. But if we plant plants that are grown from seed, we are encouraging genetic diversity of those plants so that hopefully one of those plants or 10 of those plants are gonna survive the changing climate, the warming weather, the shorter winters, the droughts, the invasive pests that we're experiencing, these heat waves, all of those kinds of things. If we can grow plants from seed and we can do it with our community, then we can make a real impact. And this is my challenge to all of you, right? You're all in this room, you're all sitting at home on Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, and we can't do this by ourselves. We have to do it together. Conservation is going to happen through community effort. We need to be making change ourselves in our own landscapes, but we can't do it alone. Our founder, Heather McCargo, lives on the west end of Portland. Um, and when she first moved in and had an absolutely amazing native plant garden, uh, it took a really long time for the creatures to find it because there wasn't anybody else doing that. But now in Portland, there are houses all over that are encouraging and growing native plants. And it is a vibrant cacophony of sound happening in her back garden. So I really wanna challenge you to build biodiverse ecosystems and resilient habitats to join the native plant movement. We need to do this together because small steps are gonna make a big difference when we can all plant one plant from seed, put in one native plant into your garden, it will make a massive change. All right, so who's gonna plant some native plants this summer? Yes, a few of you, great. There are things that you can do. You can add, maintain, and edit. And this is just a rundown of all the things that we've talked about today, right? We've talked about reducing your lawn and adding in native plants that match the conditions that you're in. We've talked about replacing non-natives with natives in your ornamental gardens. Uh, I'm never gonna dig up my irises. I promise you, they are my grandfather's irises. Those are always going to be there. But what I can do is when something dies, I can replace it with a native plant. Native plants can go in the window box and the planters. They can be those edible plants for your garden and vegetables. Um, and if we stop using pesticides and non-organic fertilizers, we'll make a big impact. And I encourage you to join community efforts. Join your neighbors, all of you here. You can make an impact in your city. 
we can get native plants into the planters. We can get native plants into any type of landscaping that's done outside of city hall or other buildings. We can advocate for street trees. If a tree comes down, advocate for a native tree to go in its place. You can pass a pesticide ban. It's something that's happening. Cape Elizabeth has done it. South Portland is working on it. Um, you can encourage less mowing in town spaces and you can battle invasives in cities and uh, in different parks. So what I want you to do is think about what seeds of resilience will you be planting? What kind of plants are you gonna put into your garden? And how are you gonna be part of helping to build a resilient ecosystem to fight climate change? So thank you. I encourage you to join us. Just want to make sure we're capturing everything. Right. So it looks like we have some um, questions in the chat and a few questions on Facebook. So we'll sort of take questions as they come up. Does anyone in the room have a question that they would like to ask? This is the real test. Let's see. <laughs> What sort of relationship, if any, do you folks have with the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Conservation in Augusta? Um, so we are very uh, close partners with Gary Fish, who's the state horticulturist, um, and he is doing a lot of great work around native plants. April, in fact, was just declared Native Plant Month um, by the governor, which is an exciting piece, just to help people remember that as we're thinking about Earth Month and Earth Day coming up this weekend, um, that native plants are part of that. We also, um, so I am a new member on the Brown Ash Task Force, um, which is a partnership between the University of Maine and the, the Department of Forestry um, and working specifically to protect brown ash. Um, lots of different places where we're engaging. We actually wrote a guide, which you can find on our website, um, about uh, how the Department of Transportation can change the way they're managing their roadsides. And if any of you want to talk to somebody in the Department of Transportation about actually implementing that guide that they funded uh, and changing the way that the highways are managed, um, we would certainly help you with that um, and it'd be all about it. We're trying to work as much as we can with the state government um, because state government controls so much of those spaces where native plants can go. Uh, so we have a question from Facebook. Uh, Judith would like to know if you have any information on growing medicinal plants. Um, when you visit our website, we do have a number of the plants um, that we have for sale as seeds identified as medicinal um, or edible plants. Um, there are a number of main native plants that are considered um, helpful in their medicinal properties. It's not part of what we specialize in, um, but we have some articles as well on our website where you can go check that out um, and learn more. We'd also really encourage you to to, um, to learn from a number of the other partners that we have in the community um, who are specifically focusing on medicinal plants and we can see the overlap. Um, Avena Botanicals is one of the um, wonderful organizations that we work a lot with. They're very specifically focused on medicinals and while they are not fully native in the plants that they sell, many of them are. Um, I have... Um... We're going back to lawns. Mm -hmm. I have a, a backyard that has um, strawberries, wild strawberries, and a lot of, a lot of yellow. No, the common one there. <laughs> Dandelions? Not forget it. Oh. Anyway, <laughs> so. What I would do is taking 20% of the water on the water, just letting that strip go wild. Well, I was hoping to see, you know, wildflowers or something in there. But I ended up with all kinds of native um, hardwood shoots in there, and it took me forever to try to, you know, tame it. Is there a method to just letting a lawn go and not having to work day in and day night to keep this 
So you're, you're not alone. Um, <laughs> it, it, creating a meadow in the truest of sense is actually one of the hardest things to do. Um, it, it really is. It's a labor of love. It takes years to go and to create something, even from scratch. If you had it completely barren um, and then you started to plant those plants in, it's still a challenge. There's so much in the seed bank uh, under the soil that so many of those different plants are going to grow up. Um, I would say, you know, one of the things that we're doing at our home is we have a lot of beautiful poplars. So the quaking aspen that are really early successional plants. Um, and I've let a number of those shoots start to grow up. I also got some purple um, that showed up in some of the spaces where I was letting it go. Um, and now we have the beginnings of a small little forested area. Having plants both at the ground cover, the herbaceous um, plant level, shrubs and trees is actually the healthiest opportunity for an ecosystem. It's going to have all of those different layers in it. So figuring out what the balance is, maybe leave one or two of those trees to, to go up um, or very much it's a it's a practice of cutting those shoots um if you don't want them there um i'm sorry there's uh, you know there's not really another way to to manage that so a question from zoom uh where can people get uh partridge peas and other native type seeds um i will direct you directly to our website. So it's www.wildseedproject.net. Um, and we sell seeds, again, of close to 100 different species. Um, and then in the summer, we also, um, in the end of August, have a plant sale. So if you're not psyched about going all the way from seed, but you want seed grown plants, um, you can join us in the summer. We actually recommend that people put native plants in the ground in the fall um, because they are not then susceptible to our increasingly dry um, and erratic summers. So you don't have to do as much care. You can care for them in pots um, all the way through the summer in one space where you're not gonna forget about them. Um, and then as they go in, in the fall, you can care for them, make sure they're rooted in nicely, um, then they'll overwinter and you'll have great plants for the next year. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a suitable question, but does ashes from a wood burning stove or fireplace have a role to play in this yeah, yeah. I mean, there. So when we talk about um, fertilizers or soil modifications, one of the things that um, I feel really strongly about, and that we do at Wild Seed Project, is um, trying to use uh, organic fertilizers. And so, uh, wood ash from wood stoves, as long as you're not burning, as long as you're burning things that haven't been, you know, wood that hasn't been treated, um, is an amazing opportunity to build up the quality of your soil in a bunch of different ways. Um, there are lots of different, for me, I really try to prioritize uh, putting the right plant in the soil, in the space where it is. I don't want to modify, and my priority is to not modify the soil to meet the plant's needs. I want to find the right plant for the environment that it's in, but um, wood ash is a wonderful addition um, to help improve your soil. Yeah. Okay, and so those are all the questions uh, that we have time for today, but if you have more, I'm sure you can reach Absolutely. out to Andrea and the Wild Sea Project directly. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much everyone.